minutes early here, because um, why not? You guys are all politely waiting. Um, so I'm going to talk about vector tiles today. I'm part of the Mapbox team, um, and this is specific to vector tiles for OSM, but you can use vector tiles for any, any custom uh, maps that you want to be fast and to support interaction. Um, I'm Springmeyer on both GitHub and Twitter, and um, yeah, the, the URL that is pasted at the bottom there to download the slides uh, afterwards to look at is also available on Twitter. Okay. So yeah, I work for Mapbox. Um, I, uh, Mapbox is based here in DC, um, just up on 14th Street in the garage that m many of you enjoyed on Friday night. Um, and if you didn't uh, visit the Mapbox headquarters on Friday night for the party, um, we also have offices in San, San Francisco that you're welcome to visit. Um, I personally work remotely out of Winthrop, Washington, which is a little town in the North Cascades outside of Seattle. But I'm often in DC and uh, hope to make it to San Francisco to see some of you there soon. Um, here's the overview of where I'm headed today. I'm going to make sure that everyone is as much as possible on the same page about what a vector tile is. Uh, it can be a little confusing because um, there's a lot of concepts that we need to grok before we can, before even I can intelligently talk about talk about them. And vector tiles are also something that are that is both very new and emerging technology, but also not new. Many people have been experimenting with um, the same type of technology that goes into vector tiles for a long time. Um, I think Mike Magursky at Stamen was serving up vector tiles out of tile stash um, half a decade ago. Um, and so my talk today is going to try to define um, the current state of how I would define vector tiles and talk about the vocabulary that I use to describe them um, in the hopes that that's helpful for getting you all on the same page about how uh, they're going to change the future of the maps we make. Um, so then I'll talk about how vector tiles actually work, how the storage scheme works that, that I've written and my Macbox uh, coworkers have participated in. I'm going to talk about a specific workflow for creating them on your local computer or on servers. And then I'm going to talk briefly about um, uh, open source tools that we have on GitHub that you can pull down to write APIs uh, yourself with vector tiles if you don't choose to publish your vector tiles on mapbox.com. Um, it's totally possible to do. And then lastly, I'll mention a few w w uh, ways to render them into be beautiful things. So what is a, ve a vector tile? Well, it's like an image tile. Um, it's easy to cache and serve rapidly. So it's scalable. Um, by design, um, and it uses the same addressing scheme. When we talk about vector tiles at a URL, um, it's just the same as image tiles. So you might refer to a tile that represents 000 ZXY, the one tile at the top of the pyramid, um, on something like osm.org, .png, and if osm.org um, in the near future serves vector tiles from the live database, then you would address it just the same. Um, and uh, the vector.pbf is a convention that we've used to say, hey, I want a vector tile, but it could be any extension. Um, we're making this up as we, as we go. Um, so you could address them the same way as image tiles at any zoom level uh, as well as you go down in the pyramid. And vector tiles can represent uh, many complex layers of data that you might want to interact with, query, or style, just like an image tile um, represents those things. Um, and the tools that I'm going to talk about today are 100% open source, just like the tools that I've worked on for the past decade with image tiles. They're 100% open source, so you can you can roll your own. Vector tiles are not something that uh, are map box specific, um, other than the fact that we have moved our entire infrastructure over to them. So we have a lot of repositories where we experiment with vector tiles. Um, but it's 100% uh, open source code that I work on. So you're encouraged to roll your own, just like many of you roll your own uh, image tiles. But of course, vector tiles are better. They contain source data, like geometries, road names, area types, building heights. Um, all of the metadata that makes OSM rich, you can put in vector tiles in a way that you can then get back out in meaningful ways. Um, but they are still very compact. Um, and uh, we did some early tests last year and found that we could fit all the data that we needed uh, for our map styles um, 
easily fit on a USB stick um, for the whole world. The trick there is we only rendered vector tiles down to zoom level 14. I'll talk about more about uh, why that is, but we can get away with that uh, later on. Um, last thing is that vector tiles are designed to be fast uh, both to parse client side and server side. And if you saw my ta talk at State of the Map uh, last year, you might not have gotten this drift because I talked a lot, uh, I talked exclusively about how my role in, in des the design of vector tiles up until last year was server side focused. Um, uh, but I have other team members which are thinking just about client side rendering. Uh, so the design is definitely appropriate for both. And uh, as you can imagine, I'm thinking a lot about client side rendering this year. Um, so vector tiles in summary in terms of definitions, uh, and this is a little bit past the facts, this is opinion, but uh, I feel like vector tiles offer a very bright future for fast, efficient, and radically customized sharing of OSM data. Um, and that's, so state of the map is important um, that we're all gathering here, the community of people and the event, because we know that beautiful maps cannot exist without good data and ways to share it. Um, so vector tiles, this is why vector tiles are important. Um, yeah, vector tiles combined with OpenGL and WebGL rendering, um, GPU-based rendering, fast rendering, I think are the future of fast custom OSM maps because as we know, the community is getting bigger and the data set is getting bigger. Uh, so we need technologies right now that are prepared for what the data set looks like a long time in the future. Um, so what we hope is that this is a performant system uh, uh, as a first priority so that it scales with the size of the data. Okay, so I hope I, I hope I've convinced you uh, that vector tiles are important, um, but I haven't glossed over the fact that they are somewhat complicated. There's new vocabulary that we need uh, to know to, to talk about them uh, at a base level, so that we can dive into some of the harder concepts, uh, like how they actually work, like uh, what's inside of them. Um, so uh, it should should be e easy to create vector tiles from any common geodata source. Uh, the ones on the left here are ones that I've been focusing on optimizing to, to render into vector tiles. Um, so any tabular or traditional geodata sources, you should be able to uh, create uh, a vector tile set from. Uh, and, and we're focusing on, we've always focused on good support in Tomo for shapefiles and GeoJSON and, and PostGIS. And we're now adding support for FileGDB, which is the ESRI uh, uh, file database format, and uh, TopoJSON. Those are some formats that we think are really important. Um, but anything can be rendered into vector tiles. Uh, so vector tiles are like, uh, and this is my metaphor that Daniel was mentioning, like a chef's choice ravioli. Um, so why? So uh, why are they like ravioli? Well, you can put anything interesting in them. Uh, and it's a little opaque, right? What is in that ravioli? We know that there's something good in that ravioli, but what actually is it? Uh, and if some of you have worked with our vector tile format, you know it's protocol buffers, which is binary. So you can't see what's in it unless you have a decoder. Um, I don't know what the metaphor here would be. I mean, the decoder is pretty simple. You eat it, and you make an intelligent guess about what's inside. But uh, uh, yeah, so they're like ravioli, but chef's choice, because I imagine a future where anyone is the chef, anyone is the artist, uh, and you get to choose what's inside, right? So it's probably going to become even more opaque and mysterious about what's inside the vector tiles in the future. If you were able to track one down on the web right now, you, you can guarantee basically guarantee that A.J. Ashton uh, from Mapbox was the chef on, on the decision making of what went into these vector tiles. Um, but yeah, I imagine in your future where every one of you that's interested uh, is the chef on deciding on, on, on the flavor, whether that's um, blueberry, <laughs> blueberry ravioli, beet ravioli, or uh, whether it's egg ravioli. Um, if anyone else likes ravioli as much as me, I'll just go back and show you those one more time. <laughs> I don't know about the blueberry, though. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> brown butter, yeah, um, butternut squash. So structure of vector tile uh, is pretty simple. Once you unpack the binary data, there's not a whole lot of complexity inside. Uh, there's layers. Um, each layer has uh, features, and features have attributes and geometries and an ID. There's a few other things in there, but that's basically it. Um, and there can be more than one layer, uh, and they're named and they have order. 
Um, so you could have a vector tile with just parks, or you could have a vector tile with parks, roads, and places uh, all, all inside. Um, once we drop, drop down to features, um, I mean, we, most of us know what a feature is, but the encoding gets a little more technical because we really want to save space. So features are um, sort of attributes dictionary encoded, which basically uh, means that, uh, you know, in OSM data we often have, you know, key value where the keys are repeated. So uh, we don't want to store name every time we put a new name in for a new feature. We only want to store it once in the whole layer. Uh, so that's what dictionary encoding allows us to do is every the first time we hit the keyword name, we store it once, and then we create an integer reference to it. Uh, and then next time we come along and hit a key name name, uh, we just store the integer, and the same thing for values. So if, uh, if there's a lot of building equal yes uh, in the attributes, we only store building equals yes once, the strings, which are a little bit bigger than integers. So that's dictionary coding. And then geometries are uh, stored as a single flat array of coordinates. So we're not uh, storing nested arrays because we found that flat arrays are much, much more optimal when you, uh, when you uh, protobuf, use protobuf uh, to encode. But we go further with geometries than flat arrays. We support lines, polygons, and points. And we also um, turn the coordinates into integers, um, because integers are smaller in the, in the tile format. And then we delta encode those. And then we zigzag encode those, uh, the delta encodings. OK, so what the heck is delta encoding? Uh, well, delta encoding is a way of encoding sequential data by difference. Um, and so the whole reason you do this is if you had um, lat long coordinates like that um, for the state of Washington, you had a big sequence of them, um, those numbers are not huge. They're not like Mercator coordinates, but they're, they're sure bigger than ones and zeros. And I created a kind of a trivially simple case here, but if you look back and forth, you can probably figure out what's going on there. If we compare the difference between the X and the Y, there's just uh, negative one each time. And if we store the negative ones rather than the original coordinates, that compresses really, 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 really well. Um, so that helps with size tremendously. Um, and then what zigzag encoding does is turn signed integers into unsigned integers um, by flipping bits. But the outcome is pretty simple to think about. Negative one becomes one. 1 becomes 2, and negative 2 becomes 3, and so on and so forth. Um, and so the reason is that if you needed, we do need to support uh, coordinates that are negative in our tiles, because we want to support data that goes a little bit outside of tile boundaries, uh, so that you don't have rendering artifacts when you ultimately go to visualize them. Uh, and also to support different labeling tricks. So we do want to support. Um, data a little bit outside, but we don't really want to pay the price of supporting both positive and negative numbers um, because it's a smaller and more compact to store just one type. Uh, so that's what this achieves. And this is a this is a part of the code that I look at it. And every time I look at it, the bit the bit fiddling is just like, what is happening there? <laughs> um, so I hope I've explained it in a way that is accessible. Um, and you might have a chance when you're looking at the code to figure out, oh, this is zigzag encoding, because it's not obvious. Um, and then building upon vector tiles, TileMill2 introduces other concepts, which you'll hear me talk about. And it might sound like jargon, so I just wanted to cover it. Um, a vector tile source uh, is a term we use in TileMill to describe any addressable set of vector tiles, so more than one vector tile that you might want to make a map with. Um, so it could be an MB tiles database that you've created um, that stores a bunch of vector tiles uh, instead of image tiles, or it could be a, a URL, or it could be a, a URL to a child JSON. Um, and then another concept which is critical to why vector tiles are a powerful tool for uh, fast cartography is overzooming. And the basic idea here is that the Z20, zoom 20 tile there, let's pretend that that's an image tile, um, which means that, or not an image tile, but that's, that's where we are on the map. That Z20 could be viewing this street here in DC, and we're on a slippy map, and that's the tile that the renderer needs to fetch to go out and visually look at the data. Um, and the idea of overzooming is that we should be able to get a beautifully rendered map with highly resolved geometries, uh, even without ever rendering that vector tile at that zoom level, which could be very expensive, right? Because if we wanted to pre-cache that, or at least uh, aggressively cache so 
uh, we would support global maps of anyone at street level to view tiles, then we might not be able to render the billions of tiles at Z20 ahead of time. But it's very easy to render the whole world down to Z14 ahead of time. So the whole idea of overzooming is that at Z14, if that's the max level that we render vector tiles to, but we want to support visualizing them deeper, we store our geometries a little less simplified at that zoom level. Uh, and then you can over zoom. So um, I, I feel like even for myself, I could repeat that explanation a couple times before I, uh, I explain it correctly. But I hope that that gets, gets you thinking about how powerful uh, this is uh, for visualization and how much uh, less work your server has to do to support the whole world uh, of fancy styles. And then, and then there's this issue of compositing. We hear about compositing a lot in map design and design in general. Um, compositing also. Uh, is important for vector tiles because you want to be able to combine them. Um, if you believe me that I see a near time future where all of you are creating vector tiles and they all might have different layers, um, then there's a future not far after that where many of us will want to mash them up. Uh, so how the heck are we going to do that, right? Um, and so I'm calling this compositing, but it's really just mashing them up. Um, so the way that I've written the support so far in Tom L2 is if, um, if you're browsing around a map and you are subscribing to multiple vector tile sources, then the ZXY coordinate that's below you, the tile that's below you, um, the render will go out and get the stack of sources that refer to that tile. And if it, if it finds them all, great. Um, all of those vector tile sets were rendered down to that zoom level and have data available at that zoom level. But if the render uh, goes out and gets those tiles and the server returns a 404, HTTP 404, or not found, then what, then what it would do is reach back up in the stack or reach farther down in the stack to see if it finds a tile. Probably up, right? Um, and so then, uh, then you'd have a situation like this where let's pretend that there's three vector tile layers and they're all broken out, or there's three layers, parks, roads, and points of interest, and they're all separate vector tile sources. And we're, we're people looking in a map uh, at Z14, and we want to see not only those points of interest, but we want to see the one road that intersects with that tile, and we want to see a park designation if, it, if we're in it. And so, uh, hypothetically, points of interest are very detailed. They should be rendered down to Z14. Great, we grab that tile. Um, but we want to see roads, but the roads aren't rendered at Z14 as vector tiles. So yeah, we reach up. Uh, oh, that's a typo. We reach up to a higher zoom level. It should be roads like Z10 and parks at Z5. Uh, sorry about that typo. And then parks are only rendered uh, at, at Z5, let's say. So you'd reach up in the stack and grab the, the highest, highest available tile. Um, so the goal would be uh, that something like this would happen all in code and you wouldn't have to worry about it. You would render a vector tile set and so would your coworker and they could be at different zoom levels and they would just combine beautifully. Trust me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So if you don't trust me, then you should participate in the emerging specification uh, and call bullshit. Um, and it is Mapbox uh, vector tile spec on GitHub. Uh, and there you can find um, uh, a pretty minimal spec. I'm just starting to write it. Um, but you can find a very healthy list of implementations. And they're not implementations of everything. They're implementations of the pieces. Uh, so it's, it's, just, it's a smorgasbord to, to, to jump through. But it's, it's a list of everything I know about now. Uh, and it's going to be a list of uh, more tools that I've heard about this week uh, that we're adding to the wiki. And it is a wiki, so please, please edit it. Edit it. Uh, and then you can jump in the 1.0.0 folder uh, to see the readme um, for the actual spec. Um, so that's about um, the background on vector tiles. And now I'm, uh, let's see, I have about three more minutes. So I'm going to go quick on how to make your own vector tiles. Um, so there's two, two key workflows to create your own vector tiles. Um, and there will be many more in the future, but two that I recommend now. There's a visual graphical way. So you would download TileML2, and you would use the source editor in TileML2. Or there's a developer workflow where you would download TileML2 and then use it on the command line. So I'm going to speed up a little bit since I am running low on time. Um, I hope I don't go too fast. But this is the technical side of the talk. So anyone that's interested in this, um, you're going to have to do more research. So uh, um, 
Yeah, here we go. So this is what a TileMail 2 scripted export would look like. You get Clone TileMail 2, npm install it. Um, it's actually very easy to install now um, because we ship binaries for most node modules that are C++. You provide a source uh, and a sync, that's the from and the to, uh, and then you would uh, use the tileAd bin copy command to basically copy tiles from a source to a sync for a given value box. So what this is doing right here is actually taking uh, TileMail 2 source data for the world and rendering vector train of it for the whole world uh, in one go. So it's a single command that renders all of it and pushes to S3. Uh, and you can see some artifacts of how big the server was uh, on, on this machine. We're doing concurrency of 16 times the number of processors and there's like 32 processors. So we got a lot of memory on this machine. And this is how we render our, our, our tiles. But what I, most of you are going to use the Source Studio. So this is what it looks like. Um, uh, it looks a lot like TileMill previous, but it's broken up into the idea of sources and styles. And this is the source view. So you can load in a shape file, and you can't style it, actually. You just get a default style. What you can do, though, is you can change details about how the vector tiles are produced, uh, which are non-visual. So we don't get visual parameters here like colors. We get tile parameters, like what's the min zoom that you want this data to show up, what's the max zoom, and how much do you want the tiles buffered on the edges. And again, that's for labeling. Uh, and then uh, there's a fields view, and this is not a fields editor. We can't change the fields in the file, but what we can do here is annotate them, because the idea here is you might create a vector tile set, and you want to tell people what this field is, because it might live on a server, and hundreds of thousands of people might make maps from it for years to the, into the future if it's a good vector tile set. Why would it need to change? So you want to annotate it. So this is more or less a metadata editor. And then you would export it out uh, into an uh, MB tiles file. And again, this is all local on your, on your machine. And it will uh, run on a Mac, Linux, and Windows when we ultimately package for those operating systems. And I did this uh, before the talk today. Basically, I started with <laughs> the Oceans polygon from OpenStreetMap. It was 530 megs. A 0 to 10 export I did, which is about as deep as you need to go for this type of data. Finished in eight minutes on a four-core MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM. So it's one million tiles, about 2,000 tiles per second. And resulted in a vector tile set uh, in an MB tiles at 187 megabytes. And then uh, from there, you could set up your own server to serve those tiles, and you could write your own renderer to render them. But obviously at Mapbox, we're interested in making this easy for to do for people that have never heard of mapping, let alone map, uh, vector tiles. So we have an easy upload. And then when you upload it to Mapbox, you get a little uh, a place to view it online. And you'll notice that there's no visual on the map there on the left yet. We're working on it right now. Um, and then you can get a map ID for it. Grab that map ID, plug it back into TileMill 2 on your local machine, and then you can start styling it. So that's the workflow. Um, but the workflow works for all types of OSM data. Um, so this is what Mapbox Streets vector tile source looks like in Tamil 2 source viewer. So this is called the X-ray preview. Um, we just try to uh, label by default every, uh, or color each new geometry by different colors. So you can kind of see into the data a little bit more than a normal style. You can turn layers on and off. You can see what zoom level they're available for. Um, this is what that looks like for New York, opening up the attributes. Again, this is uh, A.J. Ashton's uh, curating along with other, uh, the other members of our team, and he's taken the time to put all the metadata descriptions in about what these fields actually are coming from OSM data, which takes a lot of work. But we've been using this vector tile set for over a year now. This is what DC looks like. Uh, and then you can pull it in and start styling it. So many of you are probably familiar with this, this style. It's a Mapbox Streets style on top of the Mapbox Streets vector tile source. Uh, and then there's an open source style on GitHub uh, of OSM called OSM Bright uh, for TileML2. And this is what that looks like. OK, I'm almost done. So um, that's, that's the workflow, basically, in TileML2. There's a few gotchas. Uh, like Nikki said earlier, uh, it's uh, experimental or still in development software, but if you run into problems, talk to us on GitHub. Uh, we'll be working on fixing them. So the next uh, thing you might be wondering is, OK, so how do I, I'm a developer. I want to do this myself. Like, I want to I want to write an API, or I want to consume this in an API programmatically. OK, so you would want a parsing library. Um, if you're doing it in the browser or Node.js, we have uh, a repository called VectorTile.js 
that you can use. Uh, if you're doing C++ or a language that you can bind to C++, Mapnik Vector Tile would be your go-to. Uh, and there'll probably be more parsing and serialization libraries emerging soon. Uh, and then last, but probably most important to all of us, um, you want to render this stuff into beautiful things. And if you didn't catch my uh, colleague's talk, Nikki, um, before lunch, definitely find it uh, in the video stream because that's what she focused on, is uh, that you're able to focus on design when you're using vector tiles. Uh, I, know, I, I know so many people who have come to OpenStreetMap and been excited about the data and want to style it and want to experiment with it, and they never get to it, right? Because they spend their time learning a database and trying to import it and then trying to get a big enough machine to import it. So my hope is that vector tiles enable us to all to focus on this soon. Um, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because uh, obviously uh, my talk is almost over. But if you're interested in rendering vector tiles, uh, obviously check out TileML2 and particularly the sub-library called TileML uh, or Tile Live Vector, which is the, the library inside that's able to turn the vector tiles into the visual tile, tiles. Uh, and then if you're programming C++, Mapnik Vector Tile is the core of what does that. And then if you're interested in browser-based GL rendering, then come talk to us because we're working on something. It's not quite released yet. So what are the next steps uh, for me uh, uh, given the importance of this, this effort? Well, I have community work to do. Um, open sourcing more repositories, clarifying the, spec the specification, uh, creating more samples, sample code for developers that might want to help uh, collaborate, uh, and then starting to curate the community contributions and implementations to make sure that people that are new new to the subject know where to look. Uh, and then I'd also like to entertain um, getting uh, support for vector tiles on osm.org, um, if, if, if that's of interest to the osm.org developers. Uh, and I think what it'll take to do that is me getting around to releasing uh, Mapnik 3x. It's not completely coupled, but I'm, I'm one of the lead developers of Mapnik, and Mapnik's the library that osm.org org uses to render visual tiles and uh, for a long time we've been planning on upgrading Mapnik to the release that supports all languages um, because that's that's really important for the growth of OSM uh, so I'd like to see um, my next steps being to get Mapnik 3 released with HarfBuzz text shaping support uh, and vector tiles in core and deploy that on osm.org I will admit that's about the most hairy task I could imagine doing outside of my work time, but I wanted to mention it because if, if there's people out there that want to work on it, it would be easier to work together. Um, otherwise, it won't get done. Um, on, device, on device and in browser rendering, um, definitely get in touch. We're working on this. It's still experimental, but it's exciting. Uh, and then in the very near future, um, TileML2 styles will be able to upload to Mapbox.com. Everyone in the world can now up, can upload on Mapbox the sources, so the vector tile and the tiles set themselves, but you can't quite upload the styles for them yet, but, so we're working on that. And we're going to be working on TileML2 uh, in a lot of ways to try to think about how to hide some of the concepts I've talked about today without um, being too opaque. So how can we make these concepts really transparent to people, but not obtrusive is the best way I could say it. Because uh, we want this to be easy for people. Uh, and we're going to be thinking about that. So real quick, see Nikki's talk I mentioned already. Um, if you missed uh, the Stamen talk earlier on Cardo CSS, see that in the video stream. Stay for Paul Norman's talk next, because if you were wondering if I was going to talk about how to optimize your database for vector tiles, I didn't. I left that all out. Paul's talk uh, is very relevant. Um, and then definitely catch Seth's talk this afternoon. He's set up um, a variety of amazing tools on top of the vector tile idea. Uh, and has a server called Tessera that, that he's written that you could hook into. Uh, and then Mamatha from the National Park Service uh, is talking later this afternoon about how National Park Service has used TileML2 to, to regenerate um, the new version of Park Tiles, all with this TileML2 stack. They're one of the first organizations to pick it up. Um, so definitely attend her, her talk. She'll have some amazing details to share. Thank you.